Well, I'm, I'm Jill Guth of the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. I'm not Joan Blades, but I'm going to introduce her just briefly. Uh, I want to just uh, take us back for a moment to some remarks that uh, Debbie Raffel made uh, in her opening, opening comments. She articulated the vision of green chemistry, or the vision that we're trying to uh, move toward as to, is to engender a culture of green chemistry, or to develop uh, an alternatives assessment economy. Uh, in which industry is driving towards the use of safer chemicals, chemicals that are, um, uh, that are compatible with the uh, need to preserve ecological systems and human health as, as uh, the industrial economy continues to uh, meet human needs. And I, and, and I also want to hearken to the words that John Arnold uh, articulated about what we're doing at the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry, um, all the different spheres of activity and the interdisciplinary nature of what, what we're trying to do. It involves chemistry, of course, but also law, policy, health and environmental sciences, business, economics. We've, we've started to consider the role of ethics in environmental decision making. So all of these together are really articulating uh, or showing or demonstrating that this is, uh, this is an area of social change that we're talking about here. Uh, the green chemistry really does involve social change in a lot of different dimensions. And so we're really fortunate today to have with us uh, one of the heroes, really, of social change in the United States today. Uh, Joan Blades is a, um, probably best known as a co-founder of MoveOn.org, uh, but she has also formed uh, three other uh, organizations, which she is going to tell us a little bit about. She's including MomsRising.org, which is an influential uh, NGO in the public, in the chemicals policy arena. She's written two books, both of which have won awards, uh, one on, on restructuring workplaces, another on um, called the Motherhood Manifesto. Uh, and so in her, in her own words, here's how Joan describes herself. as a software entrepreneur, nature lover, former attorney, now, I'm a lawyer, uh, former attorney. I didn't know you could become a former attorney. <laughs> I wonder what that process is like. Uh, artist, mother, true believer in the power of citizens and the need to rebuild, rebuild respectful civil discourse while embracing our core, core shared values. So please, uh, let's welcome Joan Blades. Well, it's wonderful to be here and very intimidating because you all um, have very advanced degrees about high-tech things. And this is not um, a high-tech talk so much as what I've learned over the last 14 years and trying to condense it into 30 minutes, which is pretty much impossible. But I'm going to do my best for kind of the change moments because I think you guys are trying to create change. And that's the focus of this particular talk. So how many of you here are aware of Move On, know what we do, and things like that? OK, so we've got a good lo level of awareness. How about Moms Rising? That's darn good. And may I say for the rest of you, OK, how many of you are mothers? How many of you have mothers? <laughs> OK, all right, point made. The custom fit workplace, anyone heard of that? OK, we're getting limits here. I won't even go to living room conversations. That's the little baby of the whole group of these guys. But I'm going to start by telling you about Move On, which is how I got into this. Way back in 98, there was this impeachment scandal with Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. And about six months into it, Wes and I kind of looked at each other and said, this is absolutely nuts. And we sent a one-sentence petition to our friends and neighbors, under 100 of them. Congress must immediately censure the president and move on to pressing issues facing the nation. And within a week, we had 100,000 people sign that petition, which was absolutely extraordinary, especially considering 98, there weren't so many people online. This is the first four days. This is what I've come to describe as a viral moment. And that's how I ended up here today. It's really quite an accident. But we you know, had our viral moment. We got to the point with the impeachment. We got lots of people to vote. The impeachment was unpopular. And two weeks later, despite the fact the impeachment wasn't popular, the House voted to impeach. Well, we'd just gotten about, you know, half a million people involved in politics for the first time in their lives in many cases. 
and it didn't seem right to walk away at that point. So we did the We Will Remember campaign. And in 2000, we raised over $2.3 million online in small contributions, average contribution about $35. That was also extraordinary. I remember going out after that and saying, you know, it's conceivable someone could now run for office and not be dependent on special interests and the very wealthy. That's amazing. And it was amazing. But, you know, 2000 was a sort of unusual election. We thought we were doing a flash campaign, then we were thought we were just going through to 2000. But then our members basically said, no, you're sticking around. And we were about listening to our members. So we started to form an organization. And our next viral moment was the run up to the war in Iraq. And this is the very first advertisement we did, let the inspections work in the New York Times, which our members paid for. And probably what I remember the best about the run-up to the war with Iraq was the candlelight vigil we helped organize online with the Win Without War Coalition, which is just this wonderful, huge group of organizations. And it was around the world. And it was organized in about a week. Um, and after that, this is the quote that I think really kind of says it. The fracturing of the Western alliance over Iraq and the huge anti-war demonstrations around the world this weekend are reminders that there may be still two superpowers on the planet, the United States and world public opinion. You know, it was, it was a powerful, powerful moment. And it was the biggest anti-war movement in the history of the world. And it breaks my heart still that we failed to have that war not happen. But it was something that also tells us that there are new ways for us to get together and to organize. You know, people used to ask me, well, are petitions meaningful? It's, well, it's not just petitions. It's, you know, is our phone calls meaningful? It's what it, you organize so you reach people. And you know, there's the Arab Spring, there's the Tea Party, there's Occupy. The way to connect has really changed in the way people can participate. So I had gotten to the point, actually, after the first two viral moments of thinking, that, gosh, viral moments are not a good thing. I can tell you with some happiness that this was another viral moment. We've had three real viral moments at Move On. And uh, the Obama election was another one. So I, my faith was restored. And this is my, my first big learning which I'd al I already had to some extent, but this is, notice the ears are even bigger than the eyes. The really good online organizing is about listening to the members and what their top priorities are, and then helping to make them as effective as possible. This, uh, you may not recognize it at first, it is a coffin, and it represents the joyful funeral. Because when you're listening well, you're also finding that some of the great ideas, if not most of them, you know, they're not going where they need to get to, and you need to let them go. So those are my key principles from online organizing. And this is a slide I use a couple times. It's, you know, the smartphone is changing the way we work and the way we organize you know online is going to smartphones in many cases i don't know where that's going to take us but also the ipod changed the way we listen to music the computers have made it different the way we work and you know a lot of you guys have your ipads there i know you're not really listening to me it's okay i'm not hurt i really am not hurt about this it's the way we work now we're multitasking at all times but um things are changing. And that is a moment of opportunity sometimes. So the first set of learnings, we had three viral moments in the last 14 years that move on. Massive citizen engagement is now possible in new ways. And it can be really powerful and important. The ability to raise money from average citizens can be crucial. But I also have to tell you, um, we raised $80 million for Obama in 2008. So that 2.3 really changed. And that was just for Move On members. Um, thousands of online 
offline organizations are now out there helping citizens work on all sorts of issues. So we're move on was unique at one point. Now we're just one of many, which is a glorious thing. We really don't want to be the only one, and we certainly are not. And then I just want to mention, move on was five million members a couple of years ago. We're now seven. Sign on is our new petition. Well, it's a year or two old where anyone can do a petition. And if it's got that quality of getting passed along a lot, we pile on and help it happen. So we've been growing with our own members. That's a really genuine form of listening and helping our members do better. So now I'm going to take you, you know, just to the one organization I can tell you more about pretty well is Moms Rising. And that's, you know, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, I got to this piece of information that, lo and behold, it's not that there's a huge bias against women in the workplace, there's a huge bias against mothers. And if you are a mother, you're going to be making about 73 cents to an equally qualified man's dollar. And if you're a single mom, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 cents, which is a problem. You know, it begins to explain why there are so many women and children in poverty. It also begins to explain why we only have 12 women CEOs. And of the last six Supreme Court justice nominees, three men, three women, all the men had kids and none of the women did. This is a problem especially when you consider that 80% of American women become mothers by the time they're in their 40s. Um, so I thought the women's movement was doing pretty well, and it occurred to me that perhaps there was still somewhere further that we really needed to pay attention to. And um, so I helped write this book, The Mothered Men. Rosie, our classic uh, image from when women did come into the workforce in large numbers. And I helped start an organization called Moms Rising. Together, we can build a nation where children and parents, businesses thrive, and end discrimination against mothers. Because it's not really that people hate mothers. I mean, some people do, but most people don't. <laughs> uh, but it's more a systems thing. And I want to uh, draw the parallel here between the kind of work you're doing in chemistry and what I'm doing, I think you're talking about a systems approach. I think you're talking about something that's not um, terribly polarized at this time. So move on works on front page issues, whereas Moms Rising tends to work on back burner issues. And the reason there's so much bias against mothers is we don't have a system that supports them. You know, in the world, there are only three countries out of over 170 that have no paid leave for new mothers. That's Papua New Guinea, Swaziland, and the United States of America. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, we literally have women in this country going, hmm, shall I feed my family this week or take care of my new baby? Not much of a you know, question to ask someone. But that's only the beginning. You need to have work that's compatible with being a parent. T, you see, we have a direction we're going here. Toxic free childhood, we actually have a relationship. We're doing good work on toxics. Mothers are actually great people to show up because though there's a huge bias against women, mothers in the workplace, there's actually a bias for us in, with the media and with elected officials. So it's great to have moms showing up. H, healthcare for all. E, early learning and education. You see where I'm going with this, I think. R, realistic and fair wages. And S, sick days paid for all. So, you know, it's a system that allows us to thrive with these things. And we find out when we come with our stories and we do it online and in person. Um, you know, just this last year we delivered stories from Moms Rising members about how they, why they care about toxics. And we also dress up in silly outfits because people can sometimes actually listen to you more effectively when you take it in a light way. And we show up in our super mom t-shirts and pose with famous people whenever possible because not having a partisan polarized thing. And Joe said I was an attorney. I was an attorney mediator. And I'm actually that's where I find things most interesting, is finding the places where we can agree. 
And there's a lot that we can agree on. And I think with toxics, that's one of those issues too. So what's Moms Rising done? We helped coin a new buzzword, very important, maternal profiling, the employment discrimination against women who have or will have children. Um, we helped with the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the Affordable Care Act, Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. Now, that's what I want to tell you about for a minute, just because we had, you know, a little Moms Rising big moment when Thomas the Tank Engine had lead paint on it. You know, moms really don't like that kind of stuff at all. And it gathered a crowd, and we got involved with pushing through this improvement. And in the course of pushing through this improvement, they came to us and said, you know, how's this legislation looking? And we're looking through it, and we always work with policy partners because, you know, we're not experts on chemicals. That's what you guys do, and that's why I'm really happy to be asked to be here and want to say, keep on doing it and do more of it and do not do the ivory tower thing because otherwise we'll be pushing the wrong things, and that would be bad. But We've been working with Arlene Bloom here in California on the flame retardant issues, and she was reviewing, and she found some uh, paragraph and two in there that would have given us a flammability standard very similar to the one that's put all sorts of flame retardants in their furniture here in California and elsewhere. And through making introductions and her having the opportunity to educate the people writing the legislation, it didn't happen. And I want to point out that some of the best things you can do is things that you, they're going to be invisible because they didn't happen. But that's an important role too. So passing good legislation, making good things happen is important, but also stopping bad things that are often invisible is a great way to, it's highly efficient and effective. Um, multiple extensions of unemployment insurance and we won paid family leave in New Jersey and Washington State. We only have 47 more states to go. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, Moms Rising. What is it? You know, it's part of the next wave of the women's movement. It's collaborating with over 100 policy partners to turn up the heat on these issues because together we make things more effective. And Terminology like maternal profiling is actually really important. Sexual harassment really changed things in the workplace so that people could name it and make it stop. So it's a strategy for thinking about how to create change. But yes, that's the toxic signal. And uh, working in politics has really not been pretty. <laughs> As a mediator, I look at the dynamics, and they're just toxic. They're not going well. And within the realm of bombs rising, there was a piece that was completely nonpartisan that I, we've worked on policies. This is culture change, the custom fit workplace. Work policies that are more compatible with the modern workforce and make it possible for parents and anyone else that has responsibilities outside of work to meet their responsibilities both at work and outside of work. Turns out it's good for business as well as for the individuals. So there are, it's a menu of opportunities. Different jobs require different kinds of work. It's got to be good for work to be good for, to, for people to adopt it and want it. But you've got flexible work. You've got virtual work, telework, modern career tracks. I want to say UC Berkeley has a modern career track. They realized at a certain point that there were far fewer women on the tenure track than one would hope, considering how many people were graduating with PhDs. They realized all of a sudden, gosh, you don't actually have to have a seven-year tenure track. You could have an eight-year tenure track or nine-year. It would be equitable. And heck, sometimes men have other things that go on in their lives, too. And they did other things to make the career track compatible with people that have families. It doesn't hurt anybody and it actually enhances your ability to retain talent. It's a, I can tell you stories, but I have to do this in a half hour, so I have to keep going. All right, babies at work, high commitment work practices, great stuff. But within this, 
menu, there is a disruptive technology. And fundamentally, there have been better ways to work for decades and decades. And by and large, they don't happen. But in one place, it's happening more than you would think. And that's the telework piece. And here we have it te tipping towards telework. And what, you know, holding it back is tradition change, you know, trust. But, you know, you got increased business productivity and increased worker happiness, reducing the trade deficit. It's good for national security. It reduces smog, carbon dioxide, congestion. There's a lot pushing it that way. To be honest, it's really tipped this way still. There's only a fraction of the people that could do it doing it. In fact, if the people that could do it did it half time, and just those that wanted to, we would save, well, over $631 billion. That's pretty remarkable, plus 43 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. But you know, that's kind of another subject. It's just an example of an opportunity that I think we need to work on, you know, because you've got all these different entities basically facing the same direction, but there's not the kind of coordinated action one might dream of. And we've got states that are supporting it because it's good for the infrastructure. So it's at the leading edge of a culture shift. It really appears that telework is a foot in the door, and if we make the one change, maybe we can take the whole piece at the same time. And you know, there's the potential for the strategic engagement of many champions. We need CEOs talking about where it's working in their business. We need academics teaching it. Every business school should be teaching this. We need the HR folks. And we need Hollywood covering it. Um, and it's a huge opportunity, but it still doesn't quite get us to the place <coughs> I've been dreaming of, because you know, it occurs to me that the dysfunction we have politically is having a huge impact on it throughout. Climate is actually, I think, a uh, penultimate issue in some ways because if you know, the world can't sustain us the way we're used to, that would be a really big problem for everything. And that's not going to, even though it has good impact there, it's not sufficient. But there are all sorts of other places too. So we have the new graphic, Republicans love Democrats. This is the dream. Um, yes, and you laugh. I have a plan. The, the plan is called Living Room Conversations. It's a very simple plan, because massively reproducing something, I think, requires something simple. It's where a Republican and Democrat friends each invite two friends and have a conversation. And we actually did a pilot project, and it was really successful. So really six people sitting down together talking. And we had those conversations. That we put up a website because we were so happy about that. And I have a conservative partner who I'm doing this with. Um, and the pilot project's key findings, I'm starting on the negative so I can end on the positive. We live in self-segregated communities. It's not just Berkeley. We have, you know, there's, <laughs> yeah, no, not just Berkeley. It, it is something that has, been demographically shown that we're just kind of teasing ourselves apart. Um, and people have deep anxiety about speaking to people with different views. It was, that was the hardest part, getting people comfortable to come and sit down together. And we couldn't even create a fact sheet nonpartisan enough for uh, our participants. You can't even say climate change anymore and have it be perceived as not a progressive issue. And I'll say that in 2004, I talked to leadership of the Christian Coalition, because this has been an interest of mine for a while. And we were able to talk about climate. And she was actually very open to learning more about it. And her uh, daughter, Michelle, took Al Gore. She's the communications person, took Al Gore's course. That couldn't happen today. And I want to say this in light of you're working on green chemistry. I don't think you have this problem yet, and I don't want you to. I, I really think it's worth thinking about how to keep this out of the uh, polarization that happens in the area of climate. It's 
it's a thought. Maybe you don't have that concern. I've just lived with the politics for too long. And it's, all right, so every conversation was a success. The participants found common ground on conserving energy and creating greater energy independence. And people felt they were heard and learned something about others' views. So that it was a good experience for people. And I don't want you to just take it from me, so I have a conservative friend here talking about it. Yeah, this evening exceeded my expectations. I was skeptical when you asked me to co-host. I expected more strident views from the other side and thought that they would expect the same from my side. This was a great dialogue, and I have genuine interest in continuing. I like to imagine that kind of conversation happening all over this country, tens of thousands of conversations. Um, so just so you get a sense that this isn't all made up, there are ground rules. You know, you got to be curious and open to learning. And, and they're simple ground rules. Balance advocacy and inquiry. It's largely about listening, not about persuading. Show respect and suspend judgment. Seek alignment rather than agreement. You know, think of the pipeline. There were people that were opposing the Keystone Pipeline for a variety of reasons. They didn't agree on everything, but they found alignment around that. Be authentic and welcome it from others. Be purposeful and to the point. Own and guide the conversation. Everybody in that room is responsible for having a constructive conversation. And the conversations we've had have been working. I'd like to think it could spark a civility revolution, because it's my impression that people are pretty sick of the uncivility. Um, conversations that are in the mix now, we're hoping to have hundreds of conversations this year to make sure that you know, the guidelines and the conversation structures are such that Pretty much anyone can do it and have a very successful conversation. Energy, money and politics, immigration, food, obesity, health, parents and the media, voting practices, faith community conversations, Tea Party Occupy conversations. And you know, toxics would be mighty nice in here, don't you think? And that's a place where you could have some pretty constructive conversations. There are now 40% independents, more independents than Republicans and Democrats. I think that's one of the signs citizens are sick of the status quo. Um, empowering citizens to lead and tapping the wisdom of crowds. You know, there's a possibility here that not only could we start to have real conversations, but we could start finding those 80 and 100% solutions where there is agreement, and once there's that kind of agreement behind leaders, they might actually be able to do something. FDR said, you convince me, now make me do it. That, I'm, I'm into that, I like that idea. Wikipedia, YouTube, open source, there are ways to have this online, offline reinforcement, a, you know, a powerful upward spiral. You wanna make it simple? And what I've learned through Move On, Moms Rising, and my work with citizens is when you trust people, you get really impressive results. So I would love to do that. Now, this is the closing part, the Christitunity. You know, talking about the big concepts here. A lot of the big moments are Christitunity. There's a crisis, and it's also an opportunity to make something happen. Um, and I'm just going to take telework as my example for that. Snowmageddon, hurricanes, earthquake, that's a time when having the ability to do telework makes all the difference in the world. Remember Snowmageddon? They actually did that with the federal government. They made it possible for the workers to work remotely. And the last time they had a big snowstorm there, they were still working. And it did really well. Oil shortage, bird flu, deep ocean spill were unable to tap. Yeah, that was a crisis to me. I still don't understand how it happened. And it's like nothing happened. We didn't really make the, take that opportunity as much as I would have liked. This is a graph of kind of concern about climate change. I think if, think about that in terms of where toxics fits in there. Where should it be? And then how are you gonna make it 
uh, get the attention it deserves because it, you know, like the back burner issues of Mog's Rising, toxics are often very invisible and you really need to do, I think, some organizing with citizens to get, to be heard and to get the kind of uh, backing you need to do good things. I think this is a really important concept, especially for scientists. Research shows that many, and see, it starts with research. I knew that would impress you. It shows that many of our assumptions about how to reach people different from us are flat wrong. We can't count on facts to change minds. Emotions and values trump facts almost every time. Um, it's always important to keep this in mind. This is why I have you know, so much hope for the living room conversations. And you, know, you can actually take someone out of their you know, normal social context and persuade them that climate change is a big problem, but you put them back into their community, their tribe, and they no longer believe it. And if you think of that on evolutionary principles, you get kicked out of the tribe and then you die. So, you know, we have to start thinking about how we become a little less tribal or we, you know, reunite our tribes. I think this is a huge crisis opportunity, and I think as people that work with toxics, you should too, because I've seen the effect of money on politics, uh, the politics of chemicals. The Obama election, there was $7.5 billion. That was huge in 2008. That same year, Warren Buffett had $10 billion in profits, and ExxonMobil had $45 billion in profits, and all of a sudden, the ability to raise billions and millions and millions of dollars online seems dwarfed. Yeah. I find it um, a crisis-tunity, a huge proportion. I'm not sure how we're going to deal with it, but I think we do need to, as citizens, take note and do it now. This is a slide from 2010, the 98% summer launch guide. And it's just to say, I've talked about a bunch of successes. And this is to talk about something you may not remember. <laughs> because a lot of people don't remember it. And the question is, was it, uh, was it something that fizzled and went away? Was it useful? Was it a, is it, it's timing very often on things. Maybe it was helpful. And, the whole course of things, and I don't know. But it's important to remember, and I like my son Mandala for this, uh, there's a whole lot of work we do that it feels like it ends up in nothing, but it's hugely valuable, it's essential. Um, you know, that people, citizens, invest deeply in issues and in campaigns. In a campaign, half of the candidates never get elected. But it's about working for your beliefs and values. It's heroic. It's the right thing to do. And I'm really you know, just kind of honored to be working with all the people I work with. It's a wonderful thing. So, now, this has been a focus on kind of those change moments, but there's a lot in between there, and you never know when you're going to hit the right moment. So you have to keep on doing it. Uh, and that is also, you know, kind of part of the cycle that's necessary. So I start with the Google because, you know, we have separated ourselves so much in terms of right and left that at this point, if I Google Iraq and my partner Amanda Googles Iraq, we're going to get completely different articles and stories about what happened. Uh, we know when we watch Fox News and NPR that there are different viewpoints, but a lot of people don't realize that even when they Google something, they're going to get a different viewpoint depending on you know, who they are and what they've been tracked. I think as a democracy, we have to have a shared story. We have to have you know, some commonality. And so this is my you know, graphic for reweaving the fabric of our nation. Uh, it's essential, and it's time. 
So what have I learned from these four things? Um, fill vacuums of leadership. I think the original move on petition, the um, effort to stop the war in Iraq, we're stepping into vacuums of leadership to some extent. I, Moms Rising is trying to fill that space saying, hey, mothers, we got it. The women's movement, this is another part that's crucial. And yeah, custom fit workplace. Yeah, here's a place we can all gather and get together. And of course, the living room conversations. Don't we desperately need that right now? Leverage disruptive technologies. Yeah, the new media has allowed us to separate. Let's see if we can't help us also get together in more meaningful ways. Listen and serve, strong vision, big ears. Notice we have the listen and big ears. It's absolutely crucial to working well with citizen engagement. It's not about us telling them, it's about us hearing and responding. Tap into cultural and media hotspots and persistence. Um, you know, one always ends up talking about the high highlights, but it's really that ongoing effort and those moments that eventually along the way, hopefully you will have some golden locks moments when it's all just right. <laughs> so, um, and then trust the citizens. Yeah, again and again, when you engage citizens and give, let them lead, you really get the wisdom of crowds. So, this is the vision for change. You know, what's your vision? How, how will you achieve what you're hoping to change? And then you always need a rainbow at the end. That's my story. Thank you. So how, how are we doing this morning? I guess I don't have a mic. Can we do this? Okay. I can just sit with Joan. All right, so I'm going to ask Joan just a few questions. Uh, we're going to sit over here, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Yeah. And we have, I guess we're running a little late, and I understand lunch is coming, so, so we'll just do this fairly quickly. Well, thank you, Joan. That was, that was very interesting. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to ask you to reflect on a little bit is your use of the word citizen. Um, uh, your talk is about citizen-powered social change, and one of your final lessons learned is to trust citizens. But uh, you know, who exactly is a citizen, and how should people think of themselves um, you know, in, in, in the world? I mean, citizens you could think of as sort of uh, you know, the voters or people out there, people trying to reach through media. But on the other hand, everybody working in a lab, every, every scientist is also a citizen. And per, maybe think of that particularly in the context of you know, in the United States, we think of ourselves as a country of limited government, maybe particularly today, not just limited, but incapacitated government, gridlock government. So, so who's a citizen? How should people think of themselves as citizens? And um, just your reflections on that would be great to hear. Well, I got it. Right. Um, certainly, we're all citizens. And in fact, working in a lab, when you know things that I don't, you almost have, you know, I hope you feel that much more uh, the need to share with those of us that don't really get what the concerns are, what we should be working on, because if we don't have that coming back to us, um, we will not, it's the wisdom of the crowd. And so if part of the crowd stays off somewhere else and doesn't play, we are less rich as a result. So it really is, the more inclusive we are, the better our decisions are. So we sort of all need to think of ourselves, you know, as 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 citizens, not just as a chemist or or whatever. Okay, I think that's that's uh, you know, that's important. Um, now you've also another thing you mentioned that's a little disheartening, maybe to to scientists especially. Emotions trump facts. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, in, in the green chemistry, in the regulations, in all the workshops, there's an awful lot of facts being, being talked about. So I wonder what, you know, in, in your experience, like what is the role of technical knowledge and information uh, 
in a program of social change? I mean, does it matter to citizens, and how do they use it, and how does it? How does it, it matters tremendously. It's about being smart about the way you give the facts and how you present them. Yeah, I, I think the opportunity for the green chemistry story to not, I hope, if possible, to keep it out of getting highly politicized, because that's just not a good place to be right now. If you get into that dynamic, you're undermining your success. So if you can keep people's minds open, you know, you want that be curious part to be there. So well, how do, so how does how do facts though? How does a body of factual information, you know, get uh, become part of the a, a program of social change or part of the decision making process? Is it how does it how does it get from say academia academia or the scientists who create it into that process? Do, I mean, do citizens and political active people have to reach into academia and get it, or does it get thrust from academia out into? You know, social discourse. Like, what's well, your experience of how that happens? We're working on Tosca right now, right? And you're you're following the whole that whole challenge. Yes. And that's yeah, exactly. Now we're just the citizen part behind there saying, yeah, we got kids. We really don't like to have toxics in our homes. And this is my cute little child, and they have this problem because of X or Y. Yeah. So we can bring the stories, but so we want the help. So you got the emotion. But we need you to be able to tell a really clear story about what's happening and make it so that, you know, often it's a conversation between, you know, the Moms Rising uh, Toxics team and, you know, other leaders that really know more to get it so that our membership can really hear it. So it's, you know, and you want to talk to, provide people what they're ready to, able to hear. Well, that, then that leads to my last question, is maybe you could reflect or tell us in your experience what you've seen as the role of academics in, in all the organizations and, and movements that you've been involved in and how, how they've been effective or maybe how they can be more effective or just how, how you perceive the role of acad academics. Because um, they are in a little bit of a jam, right? If they conceive themselves as intellectually focused on their disciplines and, and there's a lot of, you know, intellectual purity involved in that, and yet, go ahead. Ivory Tower is not helpful, <laughs> you know, it's like, we need academics talking to the press, we need academics giving the best interest, and being, taking an active part in the, you know, policy decisions. If you're doing good work in an Ivory Tower that doesn't get to the place where it gives us benefit, it's not doing good for you or us. Um, I think we want good communication with leadership on all levels, media, leadership, and when I say leadership, that's, you know, political leadership, that's NGOs, and it's whoever else, you know, you want to push the information out and share it in its most shareable form. And you've seen that working in some of your, your organizations, advisory boards? Uh... Well, we work with policy partners at Moms Rising for expertise. You know, I'm not an expert on childcare, I'm not an expert on toxics, I'm not an expert on, I am an expert on the custom fit workplace. I got that one down. But all the rest of it, I'm not. And there's no, no way I can be. Okay, fantastic. All right, questions from the audience. Richard Leroff from the Investor Environmental Health Network. Um, riffing off your comment about the politicization of the term climate change. Um, how big a problem is there with the term green chemistry? Does green to too many audiences perhaps connote tree hugging? And, and is there a need to figure out, well, how do we message green chemistry differently to get it more, uh, more embraced by people who can, in fact, produce more benign products? You know, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I know that my Republican partner would say you'd be better off without the word green. And I don't like saying that to you because I like it. But that's worth considering if you are um, tainted by that. I haven't done the study. It may be perfectly okay. But I know that when we're doing 
uh, writing things for our mixed audience, we're sensitive to that. So it, it's very worth looking into. One last question. Hi, I'm Heather Buckley. I'm a graduate student here at UC Berkeley. Um, so going off of that same idea, so we, we hear a lot of sort of challenge degree in chemistry from the right, but as a chemist trying to communicate these things in a fairly socially, um, environmentally liberal environment, how do you also deal with challenges coming from the left? Like one of the things I kind of heard going around this morning um, after John Hartwig's talk is, oh, but those compounds he's using are brominated. Um, and maybe, maybe with or without the, the context of that. So how, how do you deal with sort of those, those challenges being coming from both sides in terms of championing a movement that is inherently, in my, in my perspective, a good movement? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Can you help me with it? Try again, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so essentially if you have if you have people from, you're trying to create a realistic movement, and so you have challenges coming from both sides, from the right-wing side that you're anticipating, but maybe also from the left-wing side, how do you create a movement, sort of come out of that ivory tower and communicate that to people when you have both sides um, of the political spectrum uh, challenging your movement and opposing it? I guess I haven't had progressive challenging the concept of green chemistry that I'm aware of, it's, it's much less visible. You know, the one reason I think you guys have a lot of opportunity to sidestep the polarization is it's not, it doesn't have the heat that the climate does, so there's opportunity in that, I believe. You know, it also means you need to organize and you know, figure ways to push and be, get some heat. Yeah, there's a benefit and burden to that. Well, maybe another aspect of Heather's question as I took it and then, and then this maybe will have to be the end I'm, I'm seeing, uh, if I could even get away with this, is that <laughs> but, uh, academics, right or not, uniform, I mean, we say academic, academia should have an input into uh, public policy, but of course not everybody has the same view. There are obviously different, ra whole range of views of academics. So people do have to take sort of a personal, uh, a personal stand, it's a personal stake. I mean, that's what Heather was talking about. I mean, you have to come out and it, cre it can create disruption of all kinds. And so how do, I mean, how do people, how do you think about that? And how do you, how do you get people to sort of take on that responsibility? Well, I guess what I'm thinking about is that the academic tribe seems to be less supportive of the members going outside of the ivory tower. And maybe as a tribe, you need to support each other in that way. Uh, that may not be what you were trying to ask about or talk about, but that is something that I have observed to some extent, that desire to stay in this pure, you know, highfalutin atmosphere, <laughs> you know, it's not going to... Well, that's interesting to sort of try to value and promote the process of engagement without judging where, you, where everybody comes down in their particular views. All right, excellent. Yeah. All right. I, I, okay, I'm hearing lunches, uh, lunches come, so let's have a round of uh, appreciation for Joan Blades. Thank you.